So hello everyone, welcome to this Buddha Talk interview. Today our guest is the Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi, I call him Bante. Uh, he is a well-known Buddhist monk of American origin and with long standing over 50 years in robes. He is mainly known for his huge translation work of the Nikayas, which are here behind me. And I think we are talking about four books of this size, Bhante, is that correct? And additionally of many other works of Pali literature, translation and essays. Also, he is known for his engagement politically as well as humanitarian work with Buddhist Global Relief. And I'm very glad that Bhante had given time today. The idea of this interview came actually from the publishing uh, house of the Buddhist uh, German Union, which has a magazine called Buddhismus Aktuell and wanted to make an article about Bante because he is turning 80 this year, I think on the end of the year actually. And we would like to do this interview and the following article to honor your life and to honor all the work that you have done. You are especially for our German Buddhist community, you have quite an importance, not only because of your writing and your engagement, but also because of your connection with a German monk called Jana Ponika Mahatera, mm -hmm. who was your teacher for 10 years and who is very well known in Germany. And for us, he is one of the founding fathers of Buddhism in Germany. And therefore, you also do have a lot of connection to Germany and you are known for many articles, visits in Germany. And I appreciate very much, Bante, that you have time. I greet you and honor you for that. And I would like to start uh, chronologically with your life. You were born as Jeffrey Block in Brooklyn, New York. And most Germans don't know much about Brooklyn. And I thought I, I present to you, Bante, a small uh, series of pictures of the time you were born in, which is actually the end of the 40s, a year. You were born a year before the end of World War II. And your use time was in the 50s. And I would like to give you a, a small reminder of how Brooklyn looked at that time. Maybe it looks familiar. Can you see that, Bante? Yeah, I can see that. Do you know what that avenue is? I'm not sure, actually. I just found this picture. I'm not sure. Yeah. This is the famous bridge. Yeah. The Brooklyn Bridge yeah. that leads to Manhattan. This is a picture of the gangs that were around uh, Brooklyn at that time. I think it was the beginning of the beat generation. Uh, let's see. The... And there's actually in the picture on the right side, you can even read uh, a little bit Hebrew, uh, yeah. which reminds us of Brooklyn as being uh, culturally very diverse or ethnically very diverse, also religiously. This is an ice cream car. Yeah, this was the famous, I don't know if it's still around, the good humor ice cream cars that used to come around during the summer with a kind of playing a little song or ringing a bell. And with the uniform people. even, huh? Yeah, I guess the driver wore a white uniform because he was called the good humor man. Ah, okay, good humor, man. And I'm surprised that kids actually could climb on the car. I think that wouldn't be allowed today. Maybe not, yeah. This is Fulton Street, the Joe's Bar. Yeah, I don't know that. And the... You probably have not spent time in bars at that time. Yeah. And here are young people again on the street. Yeah, this is the kind of style that had been popular amongst the young, yeah, the young the, men. The hairstyle of the time, right? Yeah, sort of popularized maybe by James Dean in the movie. Yeah, James and Dean had exactly that. Rebel without a cause. So. Yes, exactly. And then children playing together. Yeah. Children of 
of color oh, which it's interesting to see black and white children playing together yeah exactly and that looks to me that picture like you actually Bante, because you sometimes do that gesture of thinking <laughs> but i'm sure it's not you but i thought that looks almost like Bante in his use yeah and these are some mothers with their kids the pedestrian yeah i'm just uh, go back to that one mm -hmm. it's interesting suit coat dress any child's suit coat dress 39 cents exactly it's very cheap Church for 14 cents <laughs> yes nowadays you couldn't buy a pencil for 14 cents no <laughs> you probably pay uh, 14 dollar for a shirt today at least yeah and this is another street scene with these old cars yeah and the last 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 one is the theater uh does it look familiar to you mm, no this must have been downtown brooklyn mm -hmm. i'm stopping this here Bante, you were born uh, of jewish parents and my first question would be was your upbringing somehow influenced by religion or by religious thought or by hebrew uh, traditional practice no my parents were not religious at all so they uh, we would observe the main jewish high holidays mm -hmm. just as a way of sort of paying homage to our jewish ethnic an ancestry mm -hmm. but my parents were not religiously believers or observers or observant so i did go to hebrew school until the age of 13 in order to learn enough hebrew to undergo my what they call the bar mitzvah yeah mm -hmm. ritual so you read probably the the first lines of the bible bereshit bara elohim v'ha'aretz and so on no i think i just remember i mean now i couldn't read hebrew at all but mm -hmm. i had learned enough to read the portion of the torah that i had to recite at my bar mitzvah but at that time you actually were able to read uh old hebrew yeah it was oh. it was necessary to learn it mm -hmm. and beside the religious background of your parents which you say are not very religious do you remember any spiritual quest or a quest in you to uh, or a longing for something like religious meaning or no not at all not at not all during, not during my childhood or early teenage years and how was growing up in brooklyn at that time there must have been a very a mixed uh neighborhood i i read that even holocaust survivors actually lived in brooklyn after the war that's quite possible the, the neighborhood where i grew up was a mixture of of jewish people but not the deeply religious, not the orthodox Jewish people. So there were some pockets in my neighborhood which were populated by the Hasidic Jews, oh, you know, the Jews mm -hmm. who came from Eastern Europe, mm -hmm. who would have the payas and the yeah. long beards. Mm -hmm. But the street that I grew up was a mixture of pretty much like secularized or modernized Jews on one side, Italians on the other side of the street. And um, in some parts of the neighborhood, pockets of Irish people, Norwegians. Mm -hmm. And what was like uh, the main thing that you were interested in when you grew up? What, what was your hobby or your interest? It was just very ordinary. There was nothing really special interest, just enjoyed playing sports, you know, uh, softball and football. Mm -hmm. Were you already at that time reading a lot? Reading a little bit. I was not reading extensively and not mm -hmm. in any way reading spiritual texts or anything that would have or philosophical texts. And how about music? I, I saw you playing the piano in a very cool, almost blue style. So I thought 
Does this come from his childhood? No, not from the childhood, but um, maybe this was the time that I went and went to college. Then I came to be very much appreciative of the jazz, of modern jazz, and of the blues, the blues roots of jazz. Hmm. And probably in your childhood uh, already, the Rolling Stones traveled a little bit around and playing uh, this blue blues music that were actually uh, from the States, but they brought it back in a way, the black blues, right? Did you hear that at that time? Well, by the time the Rolling Stones came to the US, I would say that I was no longer a child. Mm. They came 1964, I believe. Mm -hmm. And um, by that time, I was 20 years old, or almost 20 years old. Yeah, yeah. And when you were a child, did you anticipate it somehow? Or could you imagine that your future would be a, a religious one, a one with ropes or or one who is writing and scholarly. I would never have had any foresight into that. So you went no, no premonition of a religious future at all. I see. So when you went to in your use, um, I, I think you entered um, college in 66, you were 22 already. But there was before, I graduated from college at the age of 20. Oh, yeah, you graduated by so I entered the age of 22. 1961, I started college. And during your youth time, did you were aware that this was a very changing and important time in history? I mean, Che Guevara and Fidel Castro uh, uh, in Cuba in 59 and you know, the building of the German wall, that's where I was born, actually in 61. The Cuba crisis, the killing of John F. Kennedy, did this affect you somehow? Well, there are several issues there. What is the Cuba crisis? I, I was aware of, but I didn't pay that much attention to it. It occurred when I was 15 years old. And we heard, you know, reports about it, but I didn't really follow current events mm -hmm. so closely in that period. Um, what were the other things that you mentioned? The building of the Berlin Wall? Yeah, that was probably far away for you, right? Yeah, that yeah. I didn't know about at all. But the killing of John the F. Kennedy. The killing of John F. Kennedy was quite the traumatic event. And what was interesting, The night before Kennedy's assassination, I had a dream that I was in a graveyard, a cemetery, and I was wandering around in the cemetery, and I came across a tombstone. And I think the tombstone, if I remember, said FDR, which stands for Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Mm -hmm but it's showing a president who has been, well, uh, Roosevelt was not assassinated, but a president who has died, mm. but who is no, best known by the three initials of his name, first, middle, and last name, mm. so FDR. And then the following day after that dream, the current president, John F. Kennedy, is assassinated, mm. and he is best known by his initials, JFK. Exactly. Roosevelt was a, a president uh, just uh, at the time when you were born, right? And then followed by Truman, I think. Yeah, mm. yeah. Roosevelt would have died. Was it 44 or 45 that he died? But mm -hmm. about the time that I was born, yeah. So for you, it was kind of history. Also, at that time, the you know, uh, UNO was founded and there was the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but as a child, one does not really uh, hear much about it. Well, if I heard about it, I would have not yet reached my first birthday. So I would certainly not have known enough English or any other language to have able to have comprehended that news. 
But how did you experience the post-war uh, USA at that time? Did it, did it shape your view of the world somehow? I would say virtually not at all, because hmm. first in, Amer in America, we didn't experience the war firsthand, the devastation of the hmm. war firsthand. There was always something happening overseas. And I just don't recall so much talking discussions about it. Mm. You know, by the time I reached, you know, the age of where I could comprehend things relating to mm -hmm. global events, you know, it was not really discussed so much. Mm -hmm. But my father, of course, participated in the war as a, and in fact, he had, was had been stationed in. At that time, it was considered part of India, but now it's in Pakistan, Karachi. Mm -hmm. As a, since he was good in art, he was, I think, part of the cartographic division, making mm -hmm. maps and doing surveillance. Mm -hmm. And he had photograph albums of photographs taken mm -hmm. in India, or at that time, India. Well, actually, he also traveled in what is now India. Mm -hmm. So the photograph that made very strong impression on me was the photograph, several photographs of the Taj Mahal. Ah, okay. The famous very, very beautiful. Yeah. 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 And there were, I think, some photos of the my father and the American soldiers with a snake tamer, somebody who's ah, tamed. Yeah. Them. The, the cobra. With flutes who, exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. who have them come out like this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. My assumption was, knowing you as a politically very interested person, that you might have uh, had interest in politics already as a youngster. But that was not the case, obviously. Well, maybe the uh, kind of awakening to political events started maybe when I was about 16 or 17. Mm -hmm. So what kind of subject did you study in college then? Okay, I started off studying philosophy. Already in college. See, mm -hmm. see, in American, the American university system, when you go to college, the first two years, you take a range of general subjects. You don't have specialization mm -hmm. during the first two years. And then the specialization starts in the junior year. So already in the first year, I sort of was inclined to philosophy. Mm -hmm. But then I wavered back and forth. I, went, I didn't have to declare a major during those two years. Mm -hmm. And so I took you know, primarily the general course requirements, mm -hmm. so a smattering of courses. And then I be became interested in literature, and I was inclining to become to specialize in English literature or even comparative literature. Mm -hmm. But then after two years, for two years, I went to a place called Harper College. Mm -hmm. It's now part of the New York State University system or U State University of New York system. Mm -hmm. And since Harper College is located near Binghamton, it's now called Binghamton University. So I went for two years to Harper College. Then I was undecided what I wanted to do. So I took a year off. And then when I decided to go back to college, then I went to Brooklyn College. Mm -hmm. And at that time, then I decided to, to major in philosophy. So then after your BA, did you immediately go to graduate school? Yeah, yeah. And then I went to graduate school in California, Claremont Graduate, yeah, that, school, Claremont Graduate University. So that was actually in, uh, in California. Yeah, it's in Claremont, California. Yeah, so California is the place where uh, the hippie movement started, right? Well, I think the hippie movements sprung up in different urban centers across the U.S. I don't know whether California had a monopoly on the hippie movement because I remember. San Francisco also, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I remember even hearing the word hippie when I was in my last year in Brooklyn College. Ah, really? Okay. Yeah. 
So. Okay. So Woodstock uh, did not, uh, Im you did not hear or were not affected by the Woodstock Festival in 69? The Woodstock was in 1969, of course, mm -hmm. in Woodstock, New York. And at that time I was in Claremont, California. Mm -hmm. So far, too far away. Yeah. Yeah, of course, we just, and at that time, I was already a novice monk in the Vietnamese system. Ah, very different. So things right. like a rock, a rock concert wouldn't have been of any interest to me. And going one year back, I don't know how it was in the States exactly, but at least in Europe, there were all these political student movements and uprisals and protests. Yep. Was that taking place in the States similarly? Yeah, what I would say, what happened in the US, even starting maybe the seeds started to emerge, perhaps even after the assassination of John F. of President Kennedy, mm -hmm. but in a way that the assassination of Kennedy had a rather traumatic impact upon the people from the younger generation from my generation. Because mm -hmm. even though Kennedy had his human faults, and he was in sort of constrained by the entrenched political establishment, but in many ways he sort of at least symbolically represented the kind of flame or light of hope for the future. Mm -hmm. Somebody who could say, do not ask what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country, sort of mm -hmm. inspiring the mood or the dimension of altruism, self-sacrifice. Mm -hmm presenting us with a global vision rather than a narrow American imperialist vision mm -hmm. as the what should be the guiding principle of US policy. And then he was assassinated and that had a really devastating impact on so yeah. many people in the younger generation. And then an entrenched establishment politician becomes the next president, Lyndon Johnson. Mm -hmm who did, I have to say, in Johnson's favor, he did start to enact policies aimed at addressing some of the great disparities and injustices in the US hmm. social and economic system, you know, especially responding to the civil rights movement under the leadership hmm. of Martin Luther King Jr. Who was killed um, in 68, right? Yeah, that comes uh, you hmm. know, a few years later. Hmm. And then Johnson also initiated he called it the, he had sort of the mobilizing vision of his administration was to be the great society with capital mm -hmm. G, capital S. Mm -hmm. And it was to be aimed at creating greater economic, social, and racial justice. Mm -hmm. And through the pressure from the civil rights movement, he enacted the civil rights law, the voting rights law, 1965. But then, sadly, he got sort of dragged into the war in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And so he had to divert so much of the US funding to the fighting the war in Vietnam, and shift the emphasis away from his vision of the great society. Mm -hmm. And that turned the youth, especially the sort of college age youth away from or at brought on a, a very deep disillusionment amongst the, hmm. you know, the educated youth, the college age youth, hmm. turning them away from, since they no longer had that kind of flame of hope and vision for the future, hmm. ignited by Kennedy, hmm. and sustained to some extent by Johnson in hmm. the first two years of his administration. And so there came I would say a counterculture emerged and developed. And I say that that counterculture divided into two main streams. So they were not, it was not in a completely sharp division that there was some overlapping of the two. But one division of the counter stream aimed, tended towards political radicalization, mm -hmm. the idea that the sharp critiques of capitalism, mm -hmm. of American, far, especially American foreign policy, mm -hmm. the American still entrenched racial system. Um, and so there emerged groups like the civil, this was what be the more radical edge of the civil rights movement or developments out of the civil rights movement, like 
core. This was the Committee for, for Racial Equality. Mm. And then amongst the black people, the Black Panthers movement mm. and more stronger anti, because the Vietnam War was gaining momentum and mm. many more American young people were being killed and coming back in coffins and body bags, mm. strong anti-war movement. So in a way, there was a, two mainstreams, the sort of black liberation movement and the, and the anti-war movement. Mm. And maybe the seeds of an anti-nuclear movement against the development of nuclear weapons. Mm. So that was one stream. The other stream was the <laughs> ch change of consciousness movement. Mm -hmm. which was set in by the use of psychedelic drugs, yeah. maybe beginning with cannabis or marijuana, and then sort of being spearheaded by Timothy Leary Absolutely. and yeah. Richard sense. Alpert. This was the psychedelic drugs movement, yeah. um, especially the use of LSD. And it was not prohibited at that time, right? I think, of course, there were laws against the use of the the cell and even the use of marijuana, mm -hmm. of cannabis, and probably laws against the use of the psychedelic drugs like mescaline and LSD mm -hmm. outside of clinical applications. Mm -hmm. But I believe that those drugs were relatively easy to produce synthetically in mm. like people who are skilled with the use of chemical mm. skilled in chemistry so they could produce those uh, LSD fairly easily and so that there was a spreading widespread use of LSD amongst young people let me guess you never experimented with drugs <laughs> no I did <laughs> you did oh nice yeah. No, first, yeah, first, <laughs> amongst people in my gener generation, I say that the experimenting with marijuana or mm -hmm. cannabis was very widespread. Yeah. Maybe at least 50%, especially in a place like Brooklyn College, maybe about 25% of the student population had some use. Yeah. Had used marijuana at some time. And what was your experience with that? Was it uh, psychedelic in some way, or was it a religious or conscious experience, or was just uh, just for fun? Well, I say that the use of marijuana was for fun, but it was with the use of LSD. And I only used it a few times, maybe four mm. or five times, that I, I saw it could bring about profound transformations of consciousness. Mm. And I don't want to draw parallels between the LSD experience and the meditative experience. Mm. They're quite different. But what I would say is that the use of these psychedelic substances sort of opened up our minds, uh, my own mind, the mind of some of my contemporaries to the idea that there are a sort of broke down the rather narrow constricted perception of reality yeah. that had been ingrained in us through the dominant culture, yeah. as well as the inherent limitations of our ordinary conscious functioning, cognitive functioning. Yeah. And it showed that there are other dimensions, profound and variegated dimensions of consciousness mm -hmm. that are accessible and that bring about profound transformations in our understanding of reality mm -hmm. and in the way we relate to the world and to other people, to, uh, to other living beings. Yeah. That was certainly a, a quest or a search for young people at that time to have experience with consciousness or forms of consciousness or even go beyond uh, normal consciousness, right? Yeah, yeah. 
it's also part of what brought Buddhism very much in into uh, the use. Uh, um, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, it was, I have to say, you know, I'm not saying this in order to encourage people who are listening, go out and start using psychedelic drugs. Because once you encounter the Buddha Dhamma, then you don't need them anymore. But in my case, it was this, I say this was one of the contributing factors that through the, not with the marijuana, which mm. was, as I said, just more fun and sort of mm. relaxed like and chilling. Mm. Yeah, some enjoyment with friends. Mm. But it was the experience, experiences with the LSD mm. that opened my mind to the possibility of other dimensions of consciousness. Mm. And then I started to say that there must be, ah, yeah, then it was a lecture that I heard around that time from Richard Alpert, yeah. who was traveling the college circuit. <laughs> they would, Richard Alpert was the one who later became Ram Das, Baba Ram Das. Exactly. He's still around with a long beard. Yeah. Yeah. He's passed away some years uh, ago. He did? Oh, oh I, yeah, yeah. I missed yeah. that out. I just saw some videos of him. Yeah. I thought he's and, still alive. Mm. Yeah. But he and Timothy Leary, they had been professors of psychology at Harvard, and they had started to experiment with LSD and psilocybin, and for this they were mm. uh, they were thrown out of Harvard University, and then they established a kind of experimental center to or, or a center, a spiritual center to experiment with psychedelic drugs. And Richard Alpert was a very good speaker, a very engaging speaker, and he would travel around to the colleges. Mm -hmm. And I'm surprised, but he was permitted to give lectures at Brooklyn College. At this time, I I transferred to Brooklyn College. And so my first year there, he gave a lecture on their center, their experimental center. Mm -hmm. And he spoke about the experiences that people were undergoing with LSD. And then he spoke about how... Um, some of these experiences have counterparts in the descriptions of the meditative experiences mm. by the sages and saints and yogis of the Eastern traditions. Mm. And sort of that stimulated my curiosity about the, what are these Eastern traditions about if they can have direct experiential access to these other dimensions of consciousness. Mm. Yeah, and I remember in his lecture, Richard Albert sort of compared the Eastern traditions more favorably to the Western religions and said that mm. in the Western religions, these higher spiritual dimensions, except for a few especially gifted saints, are taken just as items of belief. Mm. But the Eastern traditions lay out very clear formulated paths by which one could actually implement and undergo those experiences. Uh -huh. And so that set off my curiosity about Buddhism and other Eastern religions. And so I started to read in about Buddhism and Hinduism. So he said that even before he went to India. Yeah, this would have been, let's see. I think in the 70s, late, right? This, yeah, yeah, but this happened late 1964 okay. when, he, when, he, when he came to Brooklyn College and gave that yeah. lecture. So he wasn't yet in India with his guru. No, no, no. That would have come, that might have been the late 1960s. So one day, actually, you're saying that in a way, drugs have been the initial reason for being interested in Buddhism. It was, let's, let's say, one contributing factor. And mm -hmm. in the case of LSD, I don't really like to use the word drugs, yeah. because that sort of throws... Psychedelics is better. The psychedelics, it yeah. throws it under the same roof or the same umbrella with mm -hmm. things like heroin, cocaine. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Some of the others that people use, mm -hmm. the, the various opioids. Yeah. Even today, there is uh, experimentation with psychedelics uh, with mushrooms through mushrooms yeah. uh, in Switzerland in a Zen uh, Zen center there. Yeah, mm. 
under the guidance of uh, medical mm. f uh, research, which is not allowed in Germany, but it's allowed in Switzerland, actually. Mm. So but how did you then uh, become more interested in the Buddha's teaching or Buddhism in general? Yeah, well, it was actually through the experimentation with LSD. And as, as I mentioned, it was just, I just took it about four, maybe four times, mm -hmm. at the most five times. But that sort of stimulated my curiosity about these eight Eastern religions. And then I started to read, you know, just through browsing in the bookshop at Brooklyn College. And I found books, it was mainly books on Zen Buddhism that were, those were the main books available. Mm -hmm. For like D.T. Suzuki, for D. instance. D.T. Suzuki, and then he had his Anglo-American sort of interpreter, Alan Watts. Yeah. Those were the books that were mainly available. And like then there a was, Buddhist Bible or something he, he combined, right? You know, the, the Buddhist Bible was something else. That was done by an American by the name of Dwight Goddard. Who had ah, yeah, 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 right. Uh -huh. Goddard had been a sort of a liberal Protestant missionary in China, I believe. Uh -huh. And then in China, he had encountered Buddhism and then the, that stimulated his interest till the point where he converted to Buddhism and then compiled. Yeah. But at that time, uh, the books of Buddhism could be read by one single person, right? It was not that huge. You, well, you maybe in the scholarly them. field, maybe there were more books available in the scholarly field, but on the popular, say, that you would find in a ordinary bookshop, there were not that many books available. So I think my first selection of books were uh, books by D.T. Suzuki, Alan Watts, and then there was one anthology called The Teachings of the Compassionate Buddha by, it was an anthology by a professor of philosophy at Cornell, mm -hmm. E. A. Burt, which had selections from mm -hmm. the whole range of the Buddhist tradition, mm -hmm. including passages from the Dhammapada, from Pali Suttas, mm -hmm. from Mahayana Sutras, and then from some of the East Asian. Mm -hmm. And what followed after that? Did you meet then some Buddhists in person, uh, or did you go to a, any kind of meditation offer, or what was your personal uh, encounter with Buddhism then? Well, at that time in New York City, there, to my knowledge, there were no Buddhist centers available. Mm. But later I learned that there was a place called a Zen study center in upstate, uh, in uh, upper Manhattan. Mm -hmm. But this was after I was already in California, like long yeah. after. At that time, the only Buddhist place that I knew when we were in college, we would go to Chinatown, sometimes to oh. go to the Chinese restaurants there. Mm -hmm. And there were some Buddhist, uh, Buddha, some Buddhist temples there, but they just conducted the very traditional, you know, popular style rituals of Chinese Buddhism, and mm -hmm. there was no, at least to our knowledge, no proper Dharma teaching there. Mm -hmm. But one thing that sort of really impressed me was then see, while wandering around Chinatown, and then seeing the statues and images of the Buddha and Bodhisattvas, mm -hmm. and seeing the very sort of calm, peaceful faces, radiating a kind of tranquil wisdom and compassion, Mm -hmm. So that made a deep impression on me, which also intensified my mm -hmm. interest in Buddhism. You know, it was not yet enough for me to call myself a Buddhist. I didn't know mm -hmm. enough about, you know, the teachings. But then I went to graduate school in California. Mm -hmm. And when I was in my second year, is this going into the material you want to cover? Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it was when I was in my first year in graduate school, mm -hmm. and again, I was continuing specialization in philosophy. Mm -hmm. The second semester I was there, a Buddhist monk from Vietnam came to, uh, let me bring in one other thing before I get to this. Okay, so this was after 
my junior year at Brooklyn College, before my, my senior year that summer, mm -hmm. I had a friend from Brooklyn College who had gone to San Francisco to spend the summer in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. So this would have been the summer of 1965. Okay, so he was in San Francisco that summer. And I had gone to summer school to catch up with some coursework. And then after the summer school, I decided to go out to California to meet him and spend time with him. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I connected with a couple from Brooklyn College who were renting a car to drive out to California because mm -hmm. they also wanted to visit some friends there. And they had some friends in Madison, Wisconsin, about a third of the way across the country mm -hmm. with whom we were going to spend the night. And so we spent the night at their friend's house in Madison. Then the next morning, I decided it was a bright, sunny morning, very pleasant. I decided to go out for a walk before we started driving again. Mm -hmm. So I took a walk through the streets. And before long, I found myself on the campus of the University of Wisconsin. Okay, then as I'm walking around, in the corner of my eye, I see the door of one of the main buildings opens up, and out comes walking a short man with East Asian features wearing a orange colored robe. Mm -hmm. And then walking alongside him, there's a tall Caucasian man and they're walking along the, the, across the campus. And suddenly, just my eye fixated on the figure of this man. Mm. And I realized, because I knew that Buddhist monks wear saffron or ochre colored robes. Mm. I realized this is a Buddhist monk. And I was just following them with my eyes, really joyful and happy that I've seen a real, and this is 1965 America. Yeah. So there are no proliferation yet of Sri Lankan temples, Thai temples, Burmese temples, whatever. So it was so, rare, very rare to, to meet a Buddhist monk. Yeah, yeah maybe almost unique. Yeah. 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 There are no, at that point, I think that there are no, at least no Theravadan monks established mm. in, in, in America. Yeah, even the Washington Buddhist Vihara had not yet been established at mm -hmm. that point. The first uh, Theravada temple in America. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I just follow them with my eyes until they enter another building and then they're gone. And then I go back to the house and then we continue our trip mm -hmm. to, uh, to San Francisco. Okay, so now I'm in, I'm back in 1967, my first year at graduate school and now a buddhist monk from vietnam comes to live to study at the same university mm. and to live in the same residence hall where i'm living mm. and so you know we have some encounters and then i ask if i could come to see him in his room i tell him that i'm interested in buddhism and so I go to see him. It gives, he gives me some you know, very elementary introduction to Buddhism. Mm -hmm. And then I ask for some instructions in meditation. And he gives me basic instructions, mindfulness of breathing meditation. Mm -hmm. And I start to, med to do meditation regularly. And he mm -hmm. really instructs me that rather sternly, you have to, if you're getting, going to get any results from this, you have to do it twice a day. Uh, 30 minutes each time. So I'm doing 30 minutes morning, 30 minutes at night. Mm. And then um, gradually I expand till I'm doing 45 minutes morning and night. And then we wound up living together in the residence hall. And this is May 19, actually probably would have been in April 67. Mm. I asked if I could be ordained as a Buddhist monk. Yeah, my that, was quick. that was pretty quick. quick. Yeah. In, in retrospect, I would say that I was an impetuous fool. 
<laughs> since I had this rather romantic, idealized image of what a Buddhist monastic life is like. Hmm. Um, like many of us yeah. have or still have. Yeah. yeah. But s certainly my, my decision to ordain as a, as a monk was born out from the fact that I could see you know, significant changes taking place even in a short time hmm. through the meditation which the way I understand it now, this is what I understand happens. Probably those of us who have had past life experiences as practicing Buddhists, particularly with meditation, when we start to practice in this life, sort of those old vasanas mm -hmm. get activated. And so we start to have initially maybe very bright, encouraging experiences and rapid seem to be making rapid progress. Mm -hmm. But then once those old vasanas are activated, then we can run a, into a wall where things start to develop very slowly with a lot of difficulty. Yeah. Okay, but I think in that stage, I was still, or at that point, I was in the stage where those old vasanas, those old habitual impressions was, mm. were getting activated. <laughs> so that stimulated my faith and devotion, my sense of commitment. And so then I asked if he could, would give me ordination as a novice monk. And then he wrote back to the headquarters, the Vietnamese headquarters, mm. and received permission from his superior in the Vietnamese system to give the ordination. And that way I was ordained in May 1967 as a Samanera in the Viet it was actually in the Vietnamese Mahayana system. But at that time, yeah, what was interesting, this was sort of a development taking place in Vietnamese Buddhism, maybe partly also in Chinese or Japanese Buddhism, that they were sort of trying to discover the archaic or the layers of archaic Buddhism or early mm -hmm. Buddhism that had been neg neglected for so long in, in the Mahayana tradition. And so my Vietnamese teacher was like putting a lot of emphasis on, for him, the study of the Agamas in the Chinese mm -hmm. characters. Okay. Same like yeah. Thich Han did, right? Yeah, he came, well, he was a bit younger than Thich Nhat Hanh. Maybe. But Thich Nhat Hanh was in, in the United States during uh, the time of the Vietnam War and Martin Luther King. And uh, he already uh, at that time had studied the Agamas partly and also was interested in this mindfulness breathing already, right? Yeah, I think Thich Nhat Hanh had sort of discovered and sort of deeply studied the Agamas probably in his years as a young monk. Hmm. And since he came to know English well, I don't know, he might have known some Pali as well that I don't know. Hmm. But he certainly would have read the translations of the Nikayas hmm. into English. Of course, not my translations, because they were not <laughs> available at the time. Rice but, Davids and so on, right? Yeah, Rice Davids and... Um, F.L. Woodward and mm. E.R. Hare, the ones available from the Pali Text Society. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so when, when we were, I was living with the Vietnamese monk, we had ordered from the Pali Text Society mm. Mm -hmm. their English translation series of the, of the Nikayas. Mm. So did you at that time already read in the suttas of uh, the translation of the Pali Text Societies? Yeah, I didn't read cover to cover, but I read like selections of the of the mm -hmm. suttas, important selections of the suttas. You mentioned that this monk, he was a full ordained monk, right? The Vietnamese. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Monk. And he ordained you as a novice, right? Yeah, yeah. And he taught you already mindfulness of breathing in a way, right? So yeah, I understand. Yeah. Which surprises me actually, uh, because a Vietnamese Buddhist. I would imagine I would have more be engaged in in practices more Mahayana like.
actually what he taught me in the field of meditation was nothing with the Mahayana mm. uh, flavor or quality at all. Mm -hmm. Like after some time of doing the mindfulness of breathing, he also taught me the metta bhavana, the loving kindness mm. meditation. Mm. And then he taught me something which maybe it comes from the from the East Asian Mahayana tradition, but it's sort of rooted in early Buddhism. Mm -hmm. It's four contemplations which connect, which are based on four modes of developing the four foundations of mindfulness. Wow. But connected mm -hmm. each with correcting one of what are called the vipalasas or distortions. Mm -hmm. So the four are contemplating the body as inherently impure or unattractive. This mm -hmm. is going through the parts of the body and contemplation that all feeling is dukkha. Mm -hmm. Then the third is contemplating that the chitta, the mind, is impermanent and always changing. Mm -hmm. And then the fourth is the dhammas, contemplating all dhammas are non-self. The emptiness of all dhammas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So those are sort of the four contemplations that he taught me in addition to mindfulness of breathing and the loving kindness meditation. That was already a very good instruction uh, for you at the beginning. It sounds very profound already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so for how long have you been with this monk and how long have you been a novice monk till the end of your till, till you finish with your PhD, I guess, right? Or, yeah. Well, we lived together, let's say, I think for three years, this would have been 1967 to 1970, because he completed his, he did a PhD and he did a doctoral, a doctoral degree in government of all things. Ah, very interesting. <laughs> because at that time, it was very important for the Buddhists to become oh involved in po the political affairs in Vietnam because yeah, the, of the government was being taken over pretty much by the Catholics, yeah. even though the Catholics were a small minority, but they had gained the grip on the government and were trying to use the political power in South Vietnam uh -huh. virtually to promote the mass conversions of the population to Catholicism. Mm -hmm. Would you say he was uh, part of this engaged Buddhism movement that also Thich Nhat Hanh was involved in? Yeah, well, I'd say the engaged Buddhist movement was something that was a pan-Vietnamese movement. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I would not credit Thich Nhat Hanh as being a unique founder of the engaged Buddhist movement. This was widespread amongst the Vietnamese monks. Mm during that period, early 1960s, because they saw yeah. that Buddhism in Vietnam was under pretty much under assault mm. from the, I have to say rather sadly, from the Roman Catholic establishment. Yeah. Who was probably with, largely with French backing and American backing from, from the American Catholic Church. Mm. And your, let's say, Vietnamese friend in Dharma and your first teacher, you both, have you been like a bit isolated from the other students or were there more people among the uh, students who were interested in meditating along with you? Actually, there were a few others who sort of connected with the Vietnamese monk and mm -hmm. became you know, meditators under his guidance. Mm -hmm. So they didn't become, at that time, they didn't become monks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But how did you manage to stay in ropes being a student in the United yeah. States? Actually, you see, the Vietnamese Mahayana was a bit more flexible for, than, mm -hmm. say, a Theravada order would be. I see. And so he gave me the robes, and I, of course, I kept the robes, mm -hmm. but on campus, I didn't wear the robes. Ah, oh, okay, you yeah. wear no clothes, yeah. Yeah, I had my hair cut, and... <laughs> You know, before I encountered Buddhism and decided to become a monk, I had the long hair, right. not not as long as hippie style, but long right. hair and a beard. And then suddenly I'm getting really involved in Buddhism. And <laughs> a day later, I show up in class with not quite shaved, but with the hair clipped very, very short and the beard is gone. <laughs> 
and everybody is looking, what's happened to him? <laughs> I wonder, do you still have a picture of the time when you had long hair? No, no, no. It must, I know yeah. you only being yeah, bold, yeah. bold headed. Yeah, yeah. 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 Then mm. there was something interesting that happened. Let's see. This would be maybe the second year that we're living together. Okay, from time to time, this Vietnamese monk, his name, his name was Tik Jack Duk. He would tell me about some of the other monks in Vietnam. And he was always like encouraging me to go to Asia, to go to India, he thought, because there was at that time, the new Nalanda University was being established. Mm -hmm. So he thought that would be the place where I should go to study Buddhism after mm -hmm. completing my degree. And he would tell me from time to time about one of his senior monks in Vietnam called Thich Min Chau, who had studied at Nalanda University and completed a PhD degree in which he did a comparative study of the Pali Majjhima Nikaya with its counterpart, the Majjhima Agama. So like Pico Analayo did when... Uh, yeah, well, Venable Analayo is much more detailed because Venable Analayo took every single sutta, mm -hmm. whereas Thich Man Chow did a selection of suttas. Mm -hmm. But I think Venable Analayo might have, you would have to look at it, I think he might have dedicated that comparative study mm -hmm. to Thich Man Chow. Mm -hmm. as being the sort of pioneer in that field yeah. of cross studies between Nikayas and Agamas. Mm -hmm. Okay, anyway, so the second year that we're living together, he tells me that this monk Thich Minh Chau, about which he's often spoken, is coming to the United States and he'll be in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And Claremont is like about 20 miles from Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And so he tells me he's going into Los Angeles to meet Thich Min Chau, and he invites me to come along with, with him. And so the day arrives and we go into Los Angeles and Thich Min Chau is staying with a Vietnamese family because there are no Buddhist temples in Los Angeles yeah. at that point, mm -hmm. at least. Of course, maybe there are some Japanese temples, but no Vietnamese temples. And so we arrive at the house of the family. And then when we arrive, the people in the house, they go to the room and they ask the monk to come out. And the monk comes out wearing a sort of reddish orange robe, orange colored robe. And I look at him and I think I've seen him before. Let me guess, he was the one that you saw before? Yeah, so I wait, I course. wait, you know, when they first meet, they're all talking together in Vietnamese. So I wait patiently, you know, until they finish speaking. Then I come, when they finish, then I come to him and I say, is it possible, could you have been at the campus of the University of Wisconsin sometime in August in 1965? And he says, yeah, in fact, I was there. Wow, what a <laughs> coincidence. I, yeah, he says, I was visiting my friend, Richard Robinson, who was establishing a program in Buddhist studies at Wisconsin. And I was, at that time, he says, I was establishing a program in Buddhist studies at a university in Saigon. Mm -hmm. It was actually a Buddhist university in Saigon. Yeah. And so we came to discuss, you know, sort of the issues we were facing in establishing these, this program. Mm -hmm. that's, <laughs> yeah. that's amazing. Yeah. So that seems almost like the, something must have guided you to meet the right people. Yeah, and what was interesting, okay, two things interesting. First is when we were to leave from Brooklyn for California on that trip, originally we were supposed to leave on a Saturday, mm -hmm. but the couple I was to travel with, I think they had trouble getting the car on Saturday because it was a rented car. Mm -hmm. So we could only leave on Monday. Mm -hmm. Okay, if we had left on Saturday as originally planned, mm -hmm. probably that encounter would not have taken place. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. 
And then the other interesting thing is that Tikman Chow wound up translating the four, because he had studied, when he was in India, he studied Pali. Mm -hmm. And so he wound up translating the Pali Nikayas into Vietnamese. Uh, he did actually. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. they are still, uh, they, they were printed in Vietnam? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. They're, they're well known amongst Vietnamese people who are you know oh. deeply engaged in Buddhist, uh, mm -hmm. reading Buddhist literature, Buddhist texts. And were you aware of Pali Suttas at that time, of their importance, or were you drawn to the old transmission of the early Buddhism already at that time? At which time? Uh, when you met this monk and when you were a novice in the Vietnamese tradition. Well, as I, I mentioned, my Vietnamese teacher has emphasized the importance of the, for him, the Agamas or the Nikayas. Mm. Yeah, but at that time, I don't know that Thich, Nhat, uh, that Thich Minh Chau had started, had done his translation project of the Nikayas mm. from, uh, from the Pali into Vietnamese. I'm not sure. He, maybe he, yeah, I'm just not sure whether he had actually started that at that time. But I found out many years later that he had done that translation. Yeah. And Mandin, what was the subject of your PhD in, in which <laughs> yeah, did you do research at that time? Nothing to do with Buddhism at all. No? No, no, no. Just I was more, I, I was more, or something. I was more interested in Buddhism than in Western philosophy at that time. Uh -huh. But um, in order to do, first I was in the philosophy department, not the religion department. Mm -hmm. And there was just, I think, one course in Oriental, what they called Oriental philosophy. Yeah. And if I were to do a meaningful dissertation in, say, in Buddhist philosophy, I would have had to know at least one one canonical Buddhist language mm. and to have extensive reading in Buddhist texts, which I didn't have in mm. that period. Um, and so because I had done reading in the British empiricist philosophy and their mm. literature was in English, so I did my dissertation on an aspect of the philosophy of the British empiricist philosopher, John Locke. John Locke, very yeah. different to you. Yeah, not his. Of that time. He, he's well known for his political philosophy, but it was not his political philosophy, but it, it was his um, epistemology, his the theory of knowledge. But that is in somehow close to Buddhism. Epistemology is, is also a subject that relates very much to. Well, Buddhism. of course, Buddhism does have epistemologies, yeah. but. Um, I was not thinking of in any way a comparative study. Hmm. Uh, you didn't choose Wittgenstein. And Wittgenstein was quite difficult, actually. Yeah? Yeah. And I wanted, I have to confess that I wanted to finish, I was already intent on going to Asia to become, you know, fully ordained as a monk and to mm -hmm. plunge deeply into Buddhist studies. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to complete my PhD fairly quickly. Okay. Not, not, not to be delayed having to do a lot of reading and reflection and mm -hmm. maybe further court extended coursework. Yeah. So that brings us close to the end of the, the first part of this uh, reflection on your biography. What then made you go to Sri Lanka and the decision to become a, again, fully ordained monk? You have been already a monk, but you, you were searching a different tradition. What made you decide to go to Sri Lanka? Yeah, first, I'd say the first influence was that of my Vietnamese teacher. Mm -hmm. Even though, as I said, he was Mahayana from the Mahayana tradition, but he often emphasize the importance of learning the early Buddhist texts. Mm. And 
initially his idea was that I should go to India to study at this new Nalanda University, mm -hmm. or it's actually the Nalanda Institute for Pali Studies, or for Buddhist, Nalanda Institute for Buddhist Studies, mm -hmm. which was a kind of idealistic vision of reviving the original Nalanda University, the famous university of yeah, who got destroyed early centuries of 1800, I think, right? Or 1900 from that time. Yeah. No, it was more fourth century. Well, probably it became very famous and influential fifth century, sixth century, seventh century of the common era. Hmm. Okay. So anyway, his initial idea was that I should go to Nalanda University or Nalanda Institute for Buddhist Studies. But then he also thought that I should, as an alternative, go to Sri Lanka. And he had romantically, amongst the Vietnamese Buddhists, there was a romantically idealized image of Buddhism in Sri Lanka, that this is the purest form of Buddhism. And the monks, the Sri Lankan monks are living such a pure, impeccable, holy life. <laughs> Which you probably were surprised to meet. <laughs> Which, excuse me? Which you probably were surprised to meet. <laughs> yeah, if, if I encountered in Sri Lanka. Yes. Okay, so Okay, then he went back to Vietnam after completing his dissertation. He went in 19, March 1970, and I still had to complete my dissertation, mm -hmm. which I had finished at this time, I think. Oh, I think I still had to take my comprehensive exams. Mm -hmm. And then after finishing the comprehensive exams, then I had to do my dissertation. Mm -hmm. And so I, I had another two years in the United States. Mm. And during that time, he had a friend, another Vietnamese monk, who had been teaching at in UCLA, he had been invited to UCLA, UCLA to teach mm. some courses on Buddhism. And he wound up establishing a Buddhist meditation center in Los Angeles, mm. called the International Buddhist Meditation Center. Mm. And so I went to help him set up that center. This was, I think he started, could be the summer of 1970. Mm. Actually, I think it was, maybe I think it was about September 1970 that he, mm. that he set it up. And so I went to help him set it up and to, and I wound up staying, I went up staying there for a year while I was working on my dissertation. And while I was there, several Sri Lankan monks passed through Los Angeles, and I became, you know, uh, uh, connected with them and friendly with them, mm. and particularly friendly with one of them. That I, while I was working on my dissertation, I also got a part-time job as a part-time lecturer mm. in world religions at the university near Los Angeles. California State University at, at Fullerton. So this monk was named Piyadasi Tara. Oh, oh yeah, the, f the famous Piyadasi? He was famous, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. From Baji Rama Monastery yeah. in Colombo. Yeah. So he's known in Germany too. Yeah, no, actually, I, I, as you know, I went to the Forest Hermitage and got opportunity to go through all the notes of the archive and books and so on, which were probably from you. Uh, and there I found also notes and, and, and writings of Pierre Dassi, but I knew him also before, but I wouldn't say he is widely known here, but those who are engaged, uh, connected with Theravada Buddhism or somehow with Sri Lanka, they know him, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I know he, he would travel widely. Exactly. Mm -hmm. and, but I think he would go mainly to the countries where there are Sri Lankan temples. Yeah. And so he would go to England, I know Australia, and of course the United States, Canada. But anyway, so he came to stay for a few days, for about a week actually at our center in Los Angeles. 
and I drove him around to visit some places in Los Angeles, mm. and I was teaching, so I invited him to give some talks to my classes. Mm. And then when we when we parted at the Los Angeles airport, he said, someday you should come to Sri Lanka, mm. and I could arrange for you to stay in a Buddhist monastery. Mm. Yeah, so then the next year, then I had decided to go to Sri Lanka, mm. and so I wrote to him to remind him of that of those uh, promise he made to me. Yeah. And then he connected me to an elder Sri Lankan monk named Venerable Balangoda Ananda Maitreya. Who later became your pre preceptor, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 So then I wrote to Venerable Ananda Maitreya mm -hmm. and asking if I could come to stay at his temple and receive an ordination into the Theravada order. Mm -hmm. and to study Pali and Buddhism under his guidance. Mm -hmm. And then he wrote back to me and said, you're welcome to come. And so that was probably it would have been in the spring of 19, let's see, 72 that I wrote to him, to Venerable Ananda Maitreya. Mm -hmm. And so then I set out for Sri Lanka in August of nine, or actually, I set out for Asia in August of 1972. So it was directly after you received your PhD degree. Well, actually, I received my PhD in February of 1972, mm -hmm. because I completed the dissertation December of 1971. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then I had to do the, they had the oral exam where I had to defend the dissertation. Mm -hmm. Probably that would have been, my guess is that it would have been in January 72, mm -hmm. or late December, or January 70, late December 71, January 72. So I actually graduated February 1972. But I was teaching at the California State University Fullerton, so I had to complete that year of teaching before I would be free to- That was a kind of employment or you uh, t taught there as a s assistant or? No, it was a, a, f a full employment. Oh, so you have been employed before you became a full ordained monk. I yeah. never yeah. heard this. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So you have- not, not a full professor, but it was a full employment. I always right? wanted to make the fun to call you Professor Block. No, I never had that <laughs> status. But they would they called me, the students called me because they would use the word professor. Yeah. But it doesn't entail being a full professor. Yeah, exactly. It's more like a part time lecturer. Yeah. Maybe that rounds very well up the first time of your life. Yeah. That you became a lecturer and a Buddhist monk. And I'm very curious to con uh, to hear more about your life in Sri Lanka, which I would say we can meet again for the second round. Um, okay. Thanks a lot, Bante, for sharing yeah. your your childhood and uh, how you met Buddhism. I'm looking yeah. forward for part two. I'm sorry, there's nothing so interesting in my childhood. No case where I was sitting in my room. Oh, the AA. thing with the psychedelics made it really interesting. <laughs> I, I did not know that you had experience with psychedelics at would, all. Would that be shocking and no, no. demoralizing to some of the German Buddhists? No, it's the opposite. It makes you actually, it makes you interesting. Okay, okay. Yeah.